We continue with the introduction to the word, God of light and love. Open our hearts to your message of unity. Open our mind to the light of your wisdom. Open our lives to the call of your spirit. Reveal to us your holy presence. As we listen and learn this day, in the name of Christ we pray, amen. The first reading is from the book of Acts, chapter 10, beginning with the 44th verse. While Peter was still speaking, the Holy Spirit fell upon all who heard the word. The circumcised believers who had come with Peter were astounded that the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out, poured out even on the Gentiles. But they heard them speaking in tongues and extolling God. Then people said, can anyone withhold the water for baptizing these people who have received the Holy Spirit just as we have? So he ordered them to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Then they invited him to stay for several days. Here ends the reading. The gospel for today is from the Gospel of John, chapter 15, beginning with the ninth verse. As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. I have said these things to you so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. No one has greater love than this, to lay down one's life for one's friends. You are my friends, if you do what I command you. I do not call you servants any longer because the servant does not know what the master is doing. But I have called you friends because I have made known to you everything that I have heard from my father. You did not choose me, but I chose you. And I appointed you to go and bear fruit, fruit that will last so that the father will give you whatever you ask him in my name. I am giving you these commands so that you may love one another. Here ends the reading. Word of God, word of life. Thanks be to God. Some of my favorite services at church are when there are baptisms. If I know that a baptism is scheduled, I try my best to be the lay liturgist for that service. I love participating in the sacrament of baptism and welcoming new members into the family of God. Now, I don't remember my own baptism day. I was only a month old. Lutherans, like several other Christian denominations, baptize babies as well as adults. One of the reasons is in today's gospel lesson. Jesus said, you did not choose me, but I chose you. God has chosen us. God's choosing is not dependent on our goodness or faith. It is only dependent on his goodness and mercy. Babies are counted as God's people before they have anything to show for themselves. I might not remember my own baptism, but when I was a kid, I could never understand why other people did not know the date of their baptism. I knew that mine was March 31st, my brother's was May 31st, my mom's is August 23rd, and my dad's is February 2nd. On my baptism day, my mom made my favorite chocolate cake and the Holy Family sang Happy Baptism Day to the tune of Happy Birthday. We burned the candle that I had received at my baptism, and there was always a present. My parents were making a point for us about the importance of being a member of God's family. I will admit, the first time I read the lesson from Acts for this week, the part that drew my attention was Peter ordering a baptism in the name of Jesus Christ. The reading from Acts is not very long, only four verses. To truly understand the importance of this particular baptism, it is important to understand the context. Earlier in Acts, 
Peter has been traveling and sharing the good news of Jesus Christ. He had healed Aeneas. He had prayed over the dead body of Tabitha, and she woke up. Many throughout the region of Joppa had come to believe in Jesus Christ through these miracles. Peter was staying in Joppa with Simon, a tanner, when he had a vision. He was on the roof of his friend's house, and he was hungry. He fell into a trance and saw a sheet being lowered down from the heavens, filled with all the foods that good Jews were not supposed to touch, much less eat. There was a voice, get up, Peter, kill and eat. There was Peter's response, by no means, Lord, you know I can't eat what is profane and unclean. There was a counter response, what God has made, you must not call profane. It happened twice more. And then before Peter could make heads or tails out of that vision, the sheet was snatched up into heaven. The Holy Spirit said to Peter, look, three men are searching for you. Now get up, go down and go with them without hesitation for I have sent them. And sure enough, three men were knocking on the door, asking Peter to take a trip from Joppa to Caesarea. Why was the Holy Spirit making such a big deal about telling Peter he had to go with these people? It was because these men were representing Cornelius. He lived in Caesarea, located on the Mediterranean Sea, just 60 miles northwest of Jerusalem. The city had been around since the fourth century before Christ. Greek in its architecture, the city was given by Caesar Augustus to the Jewish king Herod the Great, who in turn named it Caesarea and allowed a temple to be built in honor of Caesar. Now, Cornelius was a centurion of the Italian regiment. An officer in the Roman army, a centurion commanded a hundred men each. Cornelius was a responsible man, a leader of men. But most importantly, Cornelius, like many people who lived in Caesarea, was a Gentile. Gentiles were any and all of those who were not Jews, God's chosen people. To the Jews, Gentiles were the scum of the earth, much like the food in Peter's vision that a good Jewish man was not allowed to eat. The Jewish people were not allowed to associate with Gentiles. They were certainly not allowed to visit a Gentile's home. Now Peter had already experienced great change in his life as he moved from being a fisherman to being one of Jesus' disciples to being a leader proclaiming the good news of Jesus Christ. He had seen Jesus interact with tax collectors and lepers, so Peter had been exposed to people outside his normal circle. But Peter's work had been within the Jewish community. To go to Gentiles? Really, God? That much change? It's about 30 miles between Joppa, where Peter was, and Caesarea, where Cornelius was. I bet that journey for Peter was as confusing as it was tiring. Maybe Peter was ticking off what he imagined to be the problems with what he was being asked to do. How will I explain all of this to the brothers and sisters in Jerusalem? If Gentiles are to be part of the church, how will we maintain our identity as God's chosen people? Do I have enough energy to meet this challenge? I imagine that all Peter was sure of on that 30 mile journey towards Caesarea was that God had a role for him to play. For Peter knew that he was one that God could count on. 
He was the one that always knew what to say. He was the established and authoritative leader. So imagine Peter's surprise when he showed up at the house of Cornelius and realized that whatever he was there for, it did not all depend on him. Imagine Peter's surprise to find out that the Holy Spirit had already visited Cornelius. Well, a Gentile, Cornelius has been described as a spiritual man. He gave generously to the people. When Cornelius saw a need, he sought to meet it. Even though he was a Gentile, Cornelius was a man who prayed to God, and he had an experience with God. Cornelius had a vision of an angel of God coming to him. Let me share with you the encounter as it's recorded in Acts. One day at about three in the afternoon, he had a vision. He distinctly saw an angel of God who came to him and said, Cornelius, Cornelius stared at him in fear. What is it, Lord? He asked. The angel answered, your prayers and gifts to the poor have come up as a memorial offering before God. Now send men to Joppa to bring back a man named Simon, who is called Peter. He is staying with Simon the Tanner, whose house is by the sea. When was the last time you heard your name spoken out loud by an angel of God? Pretty impressive, isn't it? And Cornelius was obedient. He was told to send some of his men to Joppa to get Peter, and he did it. When Peter arrives at Cornelius' house and hears of the vision, Peter assumed the role of a responsible, committed leader of the church and began to preach. But the Holy Spirit didn't need a long and impressive sermon. While Peter was still speaking, the Holy Spirit fell upon all who heard the word. For Peter, this was a clear message. Can anyone withhold the water for baptizing these people who have already been received the Holy Spirit just as we have? So he ordered them baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Cornelius and his family were baptized. They became members of the family of God. They had a new identity as God's beloved children. Cornelius' baptism was also transformative for Peter and his friends. From the very beginning, Jesus' church was all Jewish, which was only logical because Jesus and the apostles were Jewish. Christianity could have been a Jewish sect like the Pharisees. But God's love has no boundaries. With Cornelius' baptism, the Christian church took the first steps to being a universal church. It was the beginning of the conversion of the Christian community into a covenant people beyond Jewish boundaries. This was a radical departure, and it resulted in Christianity becoming a major religion with congregations all over the world, including ours. Peter might have been surprised when the Holy Spirit sent him to Gentiles. He had not previously seen them as part of his community. But through Cornelius, he discovered that the family of God was so much bigger than the disciples might have originally imagined. Who are the Gentiles in our lives? Who do we struggle to accept as members of God's family? Some struggle to accept people of a different race or ethnicity. Throughout the past year, the news has covered hate crimes against Asian Americans due in part to COVID. We have watched as events have highlighted the ongoing discrimination, not love, experienced by African Americans. Other people find it difficult to accept as member of God's family those of different sexual orientation or gender identity. For others, it is people with varying levels of physical or mental ability, specific occupations, or different traditions of worship. Who are the Gentiles in our lives? 
For any of us, the answer to this question might be different. In today's gospel, Jesus says, my commandment is this, that you love one another as I have loved you. We are used to expressing our love for our immediate family. Today is Mother's Day. The origin of Mother's Day as we know it took place in the early 1900s. A woman named Anna Jarvis started a campaign for an official holiday honoring mothers the year her own mother died. She put Mother's Day on the calendar as a day dedicated to expressing love and gratitude for mothers, acknowledging the sacrifices women make for their children. Today, we honor and show love to mothers and all women who nurture us. Can we also express love for other members of the family of God? Love is a decision to act in a helpful way. You and I are sent out into the world to love one another. An early example was from the ancient city of Antioch. It was a Greek city, not a Jewish one. It was there in a Gentile community that believers in Jesus were first called Christians. The congregation was also the first to send relief to suffering fellow Christians outside of their own country. A famine was reported in Palestine. Out of love, the Christians of Antioch gave according to their ability that Christians whom they had never met might be relieved of hunger. This gift was not only an expression of love, but an indication that love has no boundaries. Antioch was not a separate church but a branch of the universal church. You and I are part of another branch of the universal church called Holy Trinity. Throughout the year, the cause of the month is often an opportunity for us to express our love for the broader family of God, whether it is Adopt an Angel, Winter Relief, Love Newark, or this month's Operation Care and Comfort, offering support for deployed service members and veterans and their families. Our love, not only on Mother's Day, is a reflection of God's love. Our Heavenly Father loved us, and now we have the privilege to love others. My commandment is this, says Jesus, love one another as I have loved you. In our immediate families, and in the family of God throughout the world, on Mother's Day, Father's Day, and every day. Amen.